This talk is a spin-off of one on a World War I fallen hero who was my grandmother's brother, Ralph Donnelly. I gave this second talk in 2018 when there was activity to honor uh, the heroes of World War I at the centennial of that conflict. Pro two projects that stood out um, were, at that time were a book project at Worcester State University and the restoration of the Memorial Grove at Green Hill Park, and I will discuss them in this talk. Uh, besides uh, discussing those projects, I will also give um, a history of some of the local monuments uh, honoring World War I heroes, and in particular I will talk about the uh, Worcester Memorial Auditorium. And at the end of the talk I'll give a brief update uh, and a status on that building. Uh, but before the Worcester State uh, Project talk uh, that I'll do, I'll give you a quick history of the Worcester Memorial Auditorium. Back at the beginning of the 20th century, the city wanted a major concert venue as Mechanics Hall was not large enough and had a limited stage area. After the First World War, there had been so many losses of men from Worcester uh, in that conflict, there was motivation to create a building that gave special recognition uh, to the Worcester residents who had sacrificed their lives in the, in the war. Within days following the armistice, Mayor Pierre G. Holmes named an auditorium uh, committee consisting of former mayors as well as other civic leaders. An appropriate site for the auditorium proved difficult. The first site selected was uh, on the common facing uh, Salem Square, and a public library was to be included in the complex. However, there was strong objection from the community because the plan required the demolition of the uh, Notre Dame Church. In June 1925, the City Council moved the project forward with a plan of using an apple orchard uh, that had been owned by the Salisbury family uh, just west of uh, Lincoln Square. The deal was completed in November 1929 with a gift of 100,000 square feet at Institute Road and Highland and Harvard Streets from a group of public-spirited uh, citizens and the trustees of the Worcester Art Museum. The winning architects were Worcester's uh, Lucius Briggs and New York's Frederick C. Hirons. And the ground truck breaking took place on September 10, 1931. The architects collaborated on a design of a classical revival front facade featuring eight large Doric columns along with an Art Deco influences both inside and outside of the building. The main auditorium seats 3,500 in their seating for 675 in the Little Theater in addition. Uh, the stage area was ample with a 116-foot proscenium arch, uh, being one of the largest in the country at the time. On opening night, September 27, uh, 1933, the hall was filled to capacity. As a child, I attended many attempt, uh, events at the auditorium. I saw the Philadelphia Symphony at the uh, Worcester Music Festival, the Harlem Globetrotters, several Holy Cross basketball games, and even Bill Cosby. A highlight for me was a special Celtics game against the Syracuse Nationals celebrating Bob Cousy's retirement. A friend told me that in the 1960s, Temple Emanuel held its high holiday services in the main hall. Even then, I remember my father mentioned to me that the auditorium had poor acoustics, and his opinion was borne out by references in the newspapers that the sound was not very good. There were other issues with the building, such as the lack of parking and handicap access. In the final stages of the last century, outside factors hurt the hall's viability. In 1977, Mechanics Hall was restored to its original glory, and the Worcester Music Festival was moved to that hall. And then in the 1980s, the Civic Center was built, which provided a, a venue for larger shows. This combination of two more modern venues damaged the viability of the auditorium as an event space, with the result that the number of uh, shows and events declined to the point where the building was closed down as an auditorium. For a time, it was used to uh, store court documents in a, as a juvenile court, but when the new courthouse was built, um, it was no longer used for those purposes. The building has wonderful architectural detailing. Most notably, there's a space on the second floor to honor the World War I fallen heroes. Called Memorial Hall, it is just above the front lobby and on uh, one wall um, uh, at the entry uh, to the balcony are listed the names of the fallen uh, soldiers and sailors who, who uh, passed away in the World War I conflict. And so uh, this is a picture of uh, the wall where the 
uh, fallen heroes are uh, at the bottom. And then uh, here's a schematic on the right-hand side of both the first and second floor. And on the right-hand side, it's facing uh, Lincoln Square. And Memorial Hall is directly above the uh, front lobby on the second floor uh, overlooking uh, uh, Lincoln Square. In all my v visits to the auditorium, I never knew of or noticed a Memorial Hall. If I happened to enter through the front lobby and pass through Memorial Hall to the balcony, I did not notice the names inscribed on the wall, which included my uncle. I'm not sure if my mother's family ever knew about the name on the wall, but upon checking with one of my Donnelly cousins, uh, it turned out he did know, as his father had pointed out Ralph's name to him. Here's why I did not notice. The names on the wall do not stand out. That's on the right-hand side. Uh, that's a photograph of the names on the memorial wall. Um, they are large and sized uh, names, but they blend into the marble wall. Uh, there's my uncle's name, Ralph Donnelly. I, I can't even read it, and I'm up close to it right now. Um, in all, there are 355 names of Worcester men and women who died in the conflict. The names are listed in alphabetical order, but there's no indication of a rank, a date of death, or other vital statistics. Nor is there information if they served in the Army or the Navy, with one exception, as there were two Albert Johnsons. So uh, you can see the um, memorial wa um, wall uh, there uh, with the doorways going into the auditorium. By the way, you can do a, a rubbing of uh, the names on the wall. So for instance, here's a student from Bancroft School here in Worcester. Uh, you tape a piece of paper and, uh, uh, onto the wall, and then you take a crayon or colored pencil and just uh, uh, drag it over a few times, and then the name will be in, uh, come out. And so there's the one that I did for my uh, relative, Ralph Donnelly. The highlight of the hall is the artwork and the fine architectural detailing. The most striking feature is the immense mural above the entryways into the auditorium. Ten feet above the floor, it is 30 feet high and 57 feet wide. The mural is called The Fruits of Peace, and the artist was Leon Kroll. In conception, Kroll used the theme of resurrection in that the soldiers who died in service to their country helped create peace and harmony in a modern American city uh, composed of people of all classes and races gathered together under the American flag and all that it implies. Telegram columnist James Dempsey described the mural as having eight-foot-tall creatures mourning the war dead and carrying on the work of the world in a time of peace. In the background, a mist res, uh, rests in a distant valley, and the Worcester Hills bristle with smokestacks, um, and a church steeples uh, are in there in the uh, valley of Worcester. In the center of the painting, a young girl lays uh, flowers on the tomb of a soldier. So she's at the bottom uh, center of the uh, uh, the huge mural that's uh, located in, in the Memorial Hall. Kroll used Worcester residents as figures in the mural. Per uh, Dempsey, Kroll and his assistants were diplomats in that they used um, many Worcester influential Worcesterites in the painting. One of them was John General Thomas Foley, who had served in distinction in the war. Uh, by then he was Worcester's chief of police. The last surviving model, Lars Oscar Larson, passed away in 2018 at age 98. He's portrayed as the shirtless young man passing uh, the flag to the uh, soldier ascending into heaven. So at the top in the middle, uh, you can see uh, Lars Anderson, the shirtless young man, passing along the flag to uh, the soldier. Work on the mural started in 1938 and took three years to complete. Some observers assume it's a fresco, thinking that the paint was applied directly onto the plaster surface, but it was actually painted onto a very large piece of tapestry. In order to weave a heavy linen flax of such magnitude, Kroll found an English company that built a very special uh, large loom for the finished product. To affix the tapestry to the wall, 62 gallons of adhesive were used. The canvas was then sized with rabbit skin glue and three coats of gesso. More than 250 gallons of primer and paint were used to complete the painting, which was dedicated on May 28, 1941, just before the uh, beginning of World War II. So that's how long it took to uh, get the uh, com painting completed. Another outstanding uh, feature of the hall are the doors that are below the mural. They are made from heavy metal castings, and Jim Dempsey referred to them as fabulously ornate. 
On the left is a sword uh, rising from a sunburst over there on the left. You can see that. Um, in the middle, a Christian cross uh, over a field of poppies. And on the right, a battle axe with uh, laurel intertwined. Here's a close-up, by the way, of the, um, uh, the, the doorway on the right. And the actual doors are in two, and the doors are closed at this point. Another feature of Memorial Hall are the bas reliefs at the top of each staircase. They represent the Army and Navy and are adjacent to the mural depicting their respective military service. The Army and Navy murals are on the walls of the staircase, and their depiction of war is in contrast to the theme of peace and prosperity um, on the big mural uh, in the middle of the, uh, above the doorways. These are also by Kroll, and they are more somber tomes of gray and blue in the display of the battle scenes. While the sound of the main hall has a poor reputation, the acoustics of the Memorial Hall is a different story that is practically unknown. It boasts a seven-second reverberation, rivaling large cathedrals and making it a prime location for chamber music and a cappella music. So I'll give you a little demonstration of that right now. about that. I had to uh, move on and go on to do the rest of the talk. I'm sure that's much better than uh, me talking. Uh, that completes the auditorium features, and now I want to talk about my involvement with the Worcester State Project. Early in uh, 2018, I read a Worcester Telegram story about Linda Hickson's uh, class project to profile each of the 355 names of the wall. I learned that the public could participate in the Worcester State Project and I wanted to join. So I went through the list of the names and picked the name Brayton Nichols. The Brayton name uh, rang a bell with me as uh, I recalled that the Braytons were related to the Lincoln family uh, who's, uh, of Worcester, whose descendants I know well. Through family member Josephine Truesdale, I contacted Daniel Lincoln, who helped me find some more information on Brayton Nichols. I did not know it at the time, but uh, Dan and his father, uh, Brayton Lincoln, lived on Burgess Road in Worcester uh, back in the 1970s, uh, not too far from where I grew up. Here's some of the family's history. Charles Nichols was Brayton's father, and this portrait is on display at the American Antiquarian Society um, as he served as its longtime treasurer and ultimately its president from 1927 until his death in 1929. Charles was a Harvard Medical School graduate and practicing physician in Worcester. His first wife, Caroline Dewey, died uh, in childbirth in December 1878, so Charles uh, named their daughter uh, for her. Charles later married Mary Jarrett Brayton, who was from a prominent New Bedford family. For instance, Brayton Point on Mount Hope Bay uh, is the same family. Charles and Mary had three children. Charles Jr., born 1886, a daughter, Harriet, born 1891, and Brayton, born in 1892. 
Uh, the family residence was at 37 Cedar Street in the Elm Park District where Charles practiced medicine. Um, but the family took a break in 1905 when they traveled to Lausanne, Switzerland and stayed a year uh, there with the children attending school in Lausanne. Upon his return from Switzerland, uh, Brayton attended Bancroft School, then fitted for college at Pomfret School in Connecticut. A strong student, he was named valedictorian and was admitted to Harvard. Uh, at Harvard, a friend said he was quiet, but once he made a friendship, uh, he kept it. After graduation in 1915, Brayton prepared to go to Harvard Medical School. However, war intervened. In June 1916, he joined the Massachusetts National Guard to fight uh, Pancho Villa. Um, he enlisted as a private in Fort Bliss, El Paso, Texas, and stayed there until October 17th of that year. When the United States declared war on Germany in 1917, Brayton uh, began the many-stop journey to become a pilot. He entered tra uh, officer's training school in Plattsburgh, uh, New York, and selected aviation training. Uh, beginning in August 1917, he entered training at Curtis Aviation School in Newport News, Virginia, where he received his pilot's commission. In the last three months of the year, uh, Brayton attended uh, ground school at MIT and then was sent to Ellington Field uh, uh, in Houston, Texas, and received his uh, commission as a second lieutenant. As I say, they moved him around a lot. In July 1918, he was transferred to a finishing school in Fort Worth, and by September of 1918, he was sent to France. Um, for five weeks, he trained with the bombing school at clermont Ferrand, and then was assigned to the 166 Aero Squadron at the front. The armistice in November 1918 was simply a ceasefire, so the Army remained active in case the truce failed. Brayton's squadron was uh, first sent to Juppacor, France, then Luxembourg, and then finally Travis, Germany. At Travis, the, quad the squadron practiced single flights, practice information, and aerial photography. On April 2, 1919, the formation flight training over Caudill, a few miles from Travis, went tragically awry. Two planes collided midair and then fell and collided into uh, two more planes. Three of the planes uh, crashed, killing uh, the three uh, crew members instantly, including Brayton. The fourth plane landed in the Mosel River, where the fourth pilot drowned. Initially, uh, Bra Brayton was buried in the Stad uh, Cemetery in Travis, but later his body was transported to Worcester's Rural Cemetery. I want to know if uh, Brayton's name appeared on a plaque at his college alma mater, and I'd understood that the names of Harvard alumni killed in the wars were listed at the university's Memorial Hall, uh, but my assumption was not correct. I was wrong. Completed in 1877, Memorial Hall includes the Annenberg Dining Hall, the Sanders Theater, and a chamber called the Memorial Transept, which honors the 126 alumni who died in the Civil War fighting for the Union. However, it does not include the 71 Harvard alumni who died fighting for the Confederacy. The Harvard alumni who died in the First World War are honored in another building on the Harvard campus. Um, it's uh, called the Memorial Church at Harvard, and, w and it was built in 1932 uh, uh, for the uh, World War I Fallen Heroes. Here's a plaque with uh, Brayton's name on it, by the way, in the um, uh, Memorial Church. Back at the auditorium, there were four Worcester Academy alumni whose names appear on the wall at Memorial Hall. In addition, their names are on a plaque in a building called the Megaron at Worcester Academy. Built in 1905, the Megaron originally was a living room for the students' recreation, but its mission changed during the First World War. Banners were displayed for each class that had members in the armed services, and the stars on each banner represented uh, the member of the class uh, in, in the service. In all, there are, were uh, 732 alumni who served, with more than 300 going overseas. On the plaque, there were um, 37 fallen heroes, and besides the alumni, uh, there one faculty member is listed. A special benefit of uh, an independent school is that we keep records on alumni, so it's easy to uh, research uh, Worcester Academy's fallen heroes. On the left-hand side here of the uh, four uh, in this uh, uh, picture is a Warren, uh, Warren Hobbs, class of 1915. Uh, he joined the American Field Service on May 5, uh, 1917. Um, the Field Service was a group of American uh, volunteers who drove ambulances for the French prior to the U.S. Uh, joining the war. 
But then in December of that year, he joined the uh, French Aviation Corps and was attached to the famous Lafayette Escadrilles, the name given to Americans uh, who volunteered to join the French flying squadrons in the Allied cause. But then, in March 1918, uh, Hobbs was moved over to the U.S. Aviation Corps uh, when the Americans uh, joined the war effort. He was killed by anti-aircraft fire uh, over the lines near Ypres on June 26, 1918, and is buried in the British Military uh, Cemetery in Popringa, uh, West Flanders, Belgium. Um, center left is uh, Ralph Cook, class of 1904, who was a non-graduate, and he enlisted in New Rochelle, New York. He is on the wall at their auditorium, as he was a Worcester native. His name also appears at the Memorial Grove, which I'll talk about a little bit later, which is interesting to me because he was not a Worcester resident at the time of the, his passing, and I'll talk more about that later. Uh, then center right is uh, Harry, Henry Rockwood Knight, class of 1908, uh, known by his nickname Rocky. He was the first Worcester officer uh, killed in action in Europe. One of his descendants, by the way, uh, who attended Bancroft's group, profiled him for the Worcester State Project. And then on the far right is Morris Bailey, class of 1915. He was the son of a Worcester Academy faculty member named uh, Alice, Albert Bailey. And he, uh, Albert compiled uh, Morris's wartime correspondence into a booklet. However, uh, Morris's name does not appear at Memorial Grove as he enlisted on the South Shore and his uh, family uh, were not living at Worcester at the time of uh, uh, his passing. Uh, this slide, by the way, has uh, not too, too much to do with Worcester. This is Albert Walker Shirk, who appears on the, the wall at the Megaron, but not at the uh, other plaques around the city. He was from Peru, Indiana, and uh, he was a cousin of Cole Porter, and it was through his influence that Cole Porter came to Worcester and uh, went to Worcester Academy. And, uh, Shirk went on to Harvard uh, University, which he did not like and dropped out. And uh, because of his influence, uh, Cole Porter went to Worcester, uh, to uh, Yale University afterwards. So that's a significant little uh, uh, footnote for you to know. Now I'll move on from um, the Worcester State Project to talk about uh, another significant project uh, to honor the World War I fallen heroes. And this is the Memorial Grove at Green Hill Park. Um, and uh, the Memorial Grove was established by the American Legion Post, which unfortunately uh, is a veteran group that no longer is in existence. Um, construction for the uh, projects commenced in 1927, and the grove is dedicated the following year. And um, on this map, uh, you can see a, a depiction of where the Memorial Grove is. It's on the uh, westernmost side of uh, Green Hill Park, really uh, closest to uh, Lincoln Street. In fact, you can enter uh, and get to the Memorial Grove from Lincoln Street. Uh, otherwise, if you went up from uh, Belmont Street, you'd go past the, the zoo and past the golf course and, uh, uh, and, uh, and past the Vietnam Memorial in order to get up to the uh, Memorial Grove. The grove originally consisted of 380 maple trees, one for each member of the service from Worcester who died in the conflict. Along with the city administration, Brian McCarthy, the president of the Green Hill Park Coalition, uh, led the effort to uh, plant replacement trees because over the years a lot of the uh, trees had uh, fallen. The, en um, the entrance to the, uh, the new memorial grove is a walkway uh, to a, a patio that's enclosed by memorial posts with the names of each fallen hero affixed to the, the post. The date of birth and the date of death is indicated and they're arranged in alphabetical order but separated into service. Uh, so most of the posts are for the fallen heroes who came from the Army. But in addition, there are 27 names for the U.S. Navy and then 12 more names for Marines each of them have their own particular sections. In addition, there are 21 names of Worcester men who served for the Canadian Armed Forces, and then there's another small section of three uh, for the Worcester men who served for the British. Brian studied the criteria for the 380 names at the Grove, and you'll notice that there's a difference. There were 355 at the auditorium and 380 at the Memorial Grove. And uh, he did it by uh, researching government sources for enlistment records, but there, uh, he also researched uh, names on the Memorial Auditorium wall, um, the City Gold Star list, and the Worcester uh, Telegram list. The Grove may include uh, soldiers who signed up for the Army, uh, but hailed from uh, outside of the city. 
Um, the memorial wall back at the auditorium is a slightly different criteria. Uh, for instance, the name of next of kin contacted at the date of death on the enlistment card. Maybe they were from Worcester, so that's how they, even if the person, uh, the soldier didn't happen to live in the city, if their, their relative was in the city at the time that they were creating the memorial wall, uh, that was the criterion for the, uh, the wall there, but a different criteria for uh, the, the memorial grove. Some of the Emma Guards are listed uh, at the auditorium and at the Memorial Grove, so, um, but not all of them. So, uh, for instance, there are 24 names of the uh, Emmets uh, listed, but there's only, I think, 14 uh, listed uh, at the Grove and at the auditorium. So uh, they were Emmets and they were members of the Emma Guards, but apparently they were not from Worcester. Um, as you can see, there are different numbers of fallen heroes as there are different criteria. For instance, in uh, 2018, Al Southwick wrote a column and he mentioned that there were 432 deaths due to the war. So he was looking at a, a different set of uh, criteria for his figure. So that does it for the Memorial Grove. And now I want to move on to uh, yet another um, memorial, uh, the uh, Worcester Monument in uh, Lincoln Square. Though the auditorium was already built to honor the fallen heroes, local veteran groups felt a uh, need for a memorial that was not just a building labeled War Memorial. In their mind, the flag and the artwork would be a true memorial because it would be built and planned and designed for no other purpose. I'll talk a bit more on that topic at the end of the talk. Fundraising for the, the uh, memorial uh, started in 1929 and 125,000 uh, was raised from such diverse groups as school children and veterans organizations. The architects again were Lucius Briggs and Fred Hyron. And for this project, the sculptor was uh, Paul, Carl Paul Genuine. Um, he was hired for this project. The central feature of the memorial plaza is the lighted flagpole. When the lighting for when lighting for the flag at night was proposed, it became one of only four in the country to be lit overnight. The flag itself had a bumpy history. The flagpole was smashed uh, during installation, and then later on, its replacement was struck by lightning. The plaza has been moved twice: in 1959 and 1981. But oddly, the current location is only a few feet from the original 1933 location. Here's the artwork on the. Uh, uh, memorial. Facing each other across the uh, plaza are bas relief figures symbolizing war and peace. On the left is uh, War, a male figure who charges through flames with a sword upraised to meet peace, a female figure bearing a olive branch against a starry sky. The semicircular wall that forms a bench and backdrop to the flagpole is inscribed with the names of the battles in which Worcester companies uh, played an important role. If you visit with a friend, uh, you can try out the whispering gallery effect, uh, just like the Capitol Rotunda in, in uh, Washington, D.C. If you sit down at one end of the, uh, the, uh, the bench and whisper into the wall, it will carry all the way to the other end. And if your friend is at the other end, uh, they can hear your whisper. And by the way, I just wanted to mention there's some great news uh, with regard to this memorial. Uh, the Wing Company uh, is going to uh, build, uh, not only do a renovation of the Boys Club building, uh, which is right behind the memorial, but they're also going to be a building, a, a building next to it. And as part of the arrangement with the city of Worcester, they will uh, maintain uh, the memorial uh, right in front of their building, which is just fabulous news. This is the last slide. In regards to the future of the auditorium, the restoration is complicated because it is both a memorial and a concert space. However, I'm encouraged by the efforts the city has made for its use. In May 2018, the administration signed a contract with the American Heritage Foundation, which committed $2,500, uh, $2,500, $2,500 to study, or a quarter of a million, to study the building's potential uses as a cultural space. American Heritage has a good track record as they developed uh, Quincy Market into Faneuil Hall Marketplace. And they also found a use for uh, Boston's old city hall. 
At the end of the last of last year, the city entered into a land disposition agreement with the foundation to enter into the process of de redeveloping and preserving the building. And the plan is for the foundation uh, to take possession of the auditorium uh, quite soon. AHS has indicated that the Memorial Hall would become a uh, restaurant and the Little Theater might become an IMAX theater. A recent Telegram article described the need for an uh, elevator on the outside of the building as the, um, uh, the first floor is more than 40 feet above the street level. In closing, uh, having both the Memorial, Worcester Memorial Auditorium and the War Memorial uh, for World War I uh, located in Lincoln Square and honoring the very same war is a quirk of local history. Ostensibly a war memorial, the auditorium in reality is an, a building to honor peace. Its architecture symbolizes and celebrates a healthy, thriving Worcester rather than honoring the casualties of war. Even the major artwork in the room honoring the war dead honors prosperity in an idealized con uh, landscape rather than the cruelty of war. That is why the Veterans Group created the War Memorial right in the very same square. Clearly, they uh, objected to the auditorium not serving its intended purpose. Thank you very much.